Well, have you ever thought about studying abroad in Japan? Or maybe you've already begun the process. Either way, I really hope this video can help you. There are many different channels, whether they be through a school you're enrolled in, or through a school specifically set up for foreigners to study Japanese in Japan. Initially based on my personal experience studying abroad in Japan, three separate times through three separate programs. This is the first episode of my podcast, Travel Japan with Wes Mather, which will cover basically everything about traveling, working, and studying in Japan. And if this is something you're interested in, please consider liking and subscribing. Because this is only audio, it will be playing over some of the videos I've taken during my media jobs in Japan, as well as some personal travel videos I've taken as well. And without further ado, let's begin. Hello, and welcome to the Travel Japan with Wes Mather podcast. In this series, we explore living, working, studying, and of course, traveling in Japan. I hope to inform you on how to travel smart, safe, and with confidence, all while hopefully having an amazing time abroad. Everything you hear will be based off of my personal experiences, research, and experiences of others that I know. I'm your host, Wes Mather, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you for listening, and now let's begin. Okay, so welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of the Travel Japan with Wes Mather Podcast. This is the very first episode, and I'm excited about what's to come. So, through my narrative here, I'd like to take you through where I was in the beginning, knowing nothing about Japan, and having a fair amount of anxiety about my trip, all the way to living and working here now, speaking Japanese, and having a community of Japanese friends that I don't think I'd trade for anything. So first, why should you listen to me about this, and why does a guy from Los Angeles have any credibility on the subject? To answer that, I'm currently living in Japan for my work, which is commercial media production, and I've studied abroad at three Japanese universities, for a combined duration of just over two years, starting in 2015. During this time, I took Japanese language and culture courses, and I'm now fluent in Japanese to an extent that I can work here and communicate freely. After that, I've gone back and forth from Los Angeles to various parts of Japan yearly, often spending more than half a year in Japan, leading me to live here now. As you could have likely guessed, I definitely love it here, and so of course I'd like to share that feeling and my experiences and interest with you. So, that being said, I currently create TikTok and YouTube videos about Japanese culture, language, and my experiences here. And I've gotten a following of 330,000 on TikTok, all who I appreciate dearly. From here, I'd like to explore a medium that allows me to go far more into detail and depth on my experiences here and what I've learned, so I'm beginning this podcast. You can expect all the facts I've learned about Japan and recommendations for immersion in a new culture, as well as more of a personal narrative of my journey. I think this could be useful for learning through my experiences, whether they be random discoveries or mistakes that I've made, and I hope this can convey useful information in a way that's more human and not so much abstract facts that one could get from a textbook. So that is enough introduction, and here's episode 1, preparing for your first time in Japan. In this episode, I'm going to guide you through how to prepare for your trip to Japan, as I was guided by professional counselors in the exchange student program that I chose. This begins with me first deciding I wanted to go to Japan, all the way through my airplane taking off towards Osaka. So here we go. I decided I wanted to go to Japan as a freshman in university. I had interest in Japan because I did karate and judo as a kid. And later on that interest grew because of Japanese media. I liked Japanese movies, anime, and music. There was also an appeal that I'm not sure I can quite articulate, something about experiencing a culture that was so different from anything I've known in the West. And to be honest, I don't think anyone should really have to explain why they want to travel. I personally enjoy exploring that about myself and talking about it. However, I did travel with some people who just kind of said they wanted to go and check it out, and they couldn't quite explain why, they've always had an interest. And that's something I can appreciate and respect. Anyway, interest is interest, but the actuality and practicality of actually crossing the Pacific and going to Japan always seemed kind of out of reach. It was expensive, it was a huge cultural change, language barrier, and I really didn't know anything about the whole process. Because of this, I don't think I ever really even talked about wanting to go to Japan until I met some friends in university that also had that interest and they talked about studying abroad. I remember the feeling, kind of like a light popped off inside of me when I imagined myself going to Japan in the near future as an actual reality. This being said, I definitely come from a family that's always been supportive of travel and adventure, and I think a main reason that it seems so impossible is just how natural it is to be occupied by classes, work, daily tasks, and monthly expenses. 
Going to Japan seemed like a monolithic task regarding time and money even with the support I was blessed with, but that excitement I felt when imagining myself there was so tangible that I decided just to recklessly go for it and I scheduled an appointment with my advisor the next week. I do know that many people that also want to go to Japan don't have the advantages I had like being enrolled in a four year university or even having a family that supports travel. But I do hope that through my media I can break down any anxieties people have about travel and also share the information I've gained from the resources I was blessed with and even possibly provide any emotional support for people that are nervous. And this is a spoiler, but traveling and living in Japan is much more affordable than I ever had imagined. Anyway, so my appointment with the study abroad advisor came the following week and I was very excited. However, I was also pretty nervous because I was worried I would be told it was unrealistic or not practical. So I did prepare myself for some disappointment. And when the meeting began, immediately the requirements and recommendations for what it takes to go abroad were laid out before me, so I know that's what people came here to learn, and here they are. There are exchange programs for people of every language of Japanese capability, from absolute zero to being fluent, and you just want to go abroad to pursue your studies in the Japanese language. I was enrolled in UC Santa Cruz, which is University of California Santa Cruz, and they provided clear channels with schools they had partnerships with for me to study at. Most four-year universities have similar programs and also some city colleges have many exchange programs too. If you're not enrolled in a four-year, many city colleges have easy application processes and are pretty affordable too. At the city college close to my home called Santa Monica College, you can enroll in a beginning Japanese class for only $136. This gives you a full semester of classes and makes you eligible for their exchange program in Japan. The Santa Monica City College exchange program is for summer and it costs about $4,500 for living spaces, classes, and actually food as well. And there are also ways of studying abroad in Japan without any involvement from a school in your home country by applying directly to schools in Japan. Some examples of these that I've heard reputable things about are SNG, which is Shinjuku Japanese Language School or Shinjuku Nihongo Gakko, or Kota or TCJ, which is Tokyo Central for Japanese Language School. I'll get more into those in another episode, and they often cost about $8,000 a year, but that often does not include housing either. And for studying abroad as a high school student, there are reputable programs like Rotary, but I'm gonna get into those in another episode where I interview people with experience. So as you may have gathered, studying in Japan is definitely one of the more expensive ways of going there, but I think it has the value of having language classes as well as being part of a student community that I think can be very supportive when arriving in a new country with a new culture. And on the topic of money, here's what my study abroad counselor said about affording a trip to Japan and pricing out the budget. Across the board, every study abroad student is required to provide a bank statement that shows that you have at least $5,000 in your account. They told me that this is basically to ensure that you don't end up kind of homeless in another country or not able to pay rent or afford food. And right off the bat, I'm not proud to say, but this was already going to be an issue for me, but I'll get into that later. For tuition fees, most exchange students will pay the same price that they would pay for a normal semester or quarter at the school that they already attend. For me, at UC Santa Cruz, that would be $14,025 for a fall, winter, or spring term abroad, and $1,464 for a summer term. I later found out that most Japanese public universities cost only about $3,000 to $5,000 for a quarter or semester, about $10,000 more inexpensive, so financial points for applying directly to a Japanese school, but that's aside the point for now. Other expenses for anybody studying abroad through any program would be the visa application fee, which is $160. An orientation fee, which is estimated to be $20 to $320, and a document fee for submission of application, which is about $60. For textbooks and supplies, they wanted me to budget out about $1,200. However, another spoiler, Japanese textbooks are much more cost-effective. And I think I spent about $100 for my Japanese textbooks for a full year in Japan. Another suggested budget category was $2,100 for transportation and personal. And I definitely was smiling and nodding while listening to my advisor tell me these things, but in the back of my mind, I remember thinking to myself, yes, Wes, you are going to have to do that for more cheap. And if you haven't really guessed already, this podcast is definitely going to be focusing on traveling on a budget, so I hope that's helpful for some people. Although at some points, I will definitely touch on some things that you can have a lot of fun doing if you do feel like dropping some money. The final expense covered by my advisor was the English language test, which was not applicable to me. However, if you are a student from a different country at a United States school and you wish to travel abroad, I believe you have to take an English test to verify your English language skill. And this is also something that's needed for a lot of work in Japan. That test is about $200 at most locations, and that is pretty unfair, so sorry about that. 
My advisor then concluded that that was the end of the expenses, and the next thing that was needed was a GPA of 2.0, which fortunately I had. I think I had 3.3 at the time, so they caught me at a good point. And if I was going to be abroad for a full quarter, I needed to have enough of my general education and major requirement courses out of the way so that I could take that time off. At this point, I was so excited that this whole thing seemed doable that I made a mental note that I would do anything it takes to make that happen. I still had a full quarter of classes to schedule before I would be able to go abroad, so I thought to myself I could pack as many classes into that quarter as necessary. So finally the advisor asks me if I know where I want to study abroad and of course as you all know I say Japan and then the question comes up that I was kind of worried about and they ask me if I speak any Japanese or if I'm enrolled in any Japanese language courses here at the school. I did not and I was not and then they said to my great relief that that's okay there is one beginning Japanese course offered in Osaka for the summer. And this did end up being the course that would eventually change my life for the better. And by the way, most courses that you apply to directly um, without a school in Japan also take beginners in Japanese too, so if you're in that category, then don't give up hope on that either. So that was it. Beginner Japanese at Osaka University was the program in Japan that I was eligible for, and they hustled out the paperwork and she told me everything I needed to do and when I needed to do it by for me to get into the program. I was really quite astounded by the constant reassurance from my advisor that it was a possible goal and that I could make it happen and I've heard across the board from other exchange students that that is something they also experienced. In my mind, the monetary issue was the only thing holding me back, and almost like she read my thoughts, she told me about scholarships. She rifled through some paperwork, then told me the names of several organizations that would help students that were hoping to study abroad in Japan, such as JASO, which is JSSO, Japan Study Support, and also the Global 30 Project. I'll talk about the application process later, and also how I believe I got accepted. Scholarships and student loans are available to people outside of a four-year university also, so if you're traveling to Japan to study, that's something to look into, no matter how you do it. So, the mountain of paperwork was handed to me, and the online applications were emailed to me, and they sent me on my way. I remember that time so clearly, just beaming, being so happy, and leaving that office with the neon lights and the flags of so many different countries posted on the wall, and walking into the Santa Cruz forest. A dream that had been in the back of my mind for such a long time suddenly felt more achievable and almost like a reality, and I remember walking through the cool Santa Cruz forest back to my dorm. I remember smiling so much on that walk back, passing different people, and I was so happy my advisor did everything she could to make my dream happen. And I remember every single song that I listened to on my iPod. A very tangible motivation had come over me, and I felt a very strong drive to study and to save money and to even work out more. And in a way, I do know that motivation can only take you so far, and that actions and discipline based on that motivation are what's needed to make goals happen, but that motivation also is important. And 300%, the feeling of being prepared for disappointment and walking away from that experience with a path to achievement was amazing. And that was a source of motivation that was grand and I hadn't felt something like that for quite a long time. I remember the first thing that I did when I got back to my dorm is open Google Maps and look at the Osaka Minnow campus where I might be studying abroad if I got accepted. As many people know, in Google Maps you can look at the street view of almost any place in the world and that's a really cool kind of virtual tour that you can take of any place. Most of the photos I'd seen of Japan were very commercial and processed, so it was cool to see a very raw image of the streets I might be living on. This was even more fuel to my excitement, and here's the application process as it took place over the next couple of weeks and how I began to prepare for my trip to Japan. So I know that doing paperwork isn't very exciting, and definitely listening to somebody tell a story about doing paperwork is even less exciting, so I'll be kind of brief on this, but I want to touch upon the most important parts. So first I had to apply directly to the school um, of Osaka University. This included my basic information, a photocopy of my passport, a one-page essay about why I wanted to study abroad, and a recent passport photo that is two inches by two inches so that they could use it to make my student ID from Osaka University, which sounded so cool to me. These passport photos can be taken at CVS, Rite Aid, any sort of drugstore, or any place that has sort of a professional photo booth. I think it often costs about 5 to $20, and it's pretty quick, without any appointment. However, I had my friend take mine with my iPhone 4, and then I used the school printers to print it out onto photo paper to save some money. That took some trial and error, and it's not really something I would probably recommend, but I think I'm just going to go with full honesty with my process in this podcast, so yeah, that's what happened there. For the one-page essay about why I wanted to study abroad in Japan, I basically touched upon everything that I talked about earlier, how um, judo and Japanese media inspired an interest in me in Japanese culture, and I also went into how I felt that experiencing a culture and country that was so different from anything I've seen in the West could really open my mindset, and that would be something that would be invaluable to me as a person and for future experiences. 
I also wrote a little bit about how I was into making media and studying media creation, and I would love to make media about my experience in Japan. I'm not sure if that helped or not, but in the end, it did inevitably work. Anyway, after the school application, I had to do my visa application. This also included basic information, another recent passport photo, address, height, eye color, whether or not I had a criminal background, which I did not if anyone has, or I still don't if anyone had any doubts about that, and another photocopy of my passport. After the visa application, I had to turn in several documents, such as that troublesome bank statement stating I had $5,000 in my bank account, and a doctor's note saying that I was fit to travel physically, as well as a letter of recommendation and approval from my advisor. This would be my major advisor from the digital media faculty, basically stating that I could study abroad and that would not interrupt my studies here or get in the way of me achieving my major degree. Last was a sheet of paper stating things I could do to prepare for my trip to Japan, and I'll get into that in detail later because that could be useful for anybody going to Japan for any reason. So everything was going pretty smoothly, even if I had to be a bit flexible. My meeting with my faculty advisor went fantastically, and she was actually somebody that really enjoyed Japanese culture herself. I'll call her Mrs. T, and she was thrilled with the prospect of me studying abroad, as I think most teachers really are. Mrs. T said that in order for it to work in my academic schedule, I would have to take a full course load the next quarter, and it would be definitely academically challenging, but if I pushed for it, it was doable. Doing so would not only free me up for summer semester, but it would also give me room to take Japanese courses upon my return in the fall, if that is something I wanted to do. Now, full disclosure, I am personally not somebody that is naturally academically inclined. I know full well the amount of time and effort it takes for me to actually internalize information, and that's actually likely more time than most people, so I didn't take the action of signing up for my spring quarter with a full course load, maxing out my units lightly at all. I knew that it would be difficult for me, but I knew I had to try, and furthermore, I never really intended to learn Japanese fully. It kind of just felt beyond me, but if that can be inspiring for anybody else that thinks they can't really do it, then I hope that you hear this. As of recording this podcast, I can speak fluently with people of all walks of life in Japan, and that is something that I'm very happy about. So, Mrs. T, my faculty academic advisor, gave me her letter of approval after signing me up for a very difficult spring quarter, and I was off. That was also the second case where a person of authority within my school was very excited to help me, so that was kind of inspiring as well. Next, I went to my doctor to get his letter of approval to show that I was physically fit to travel. I had a brief physical examination, I answered some very personal questions, and I was cleared. The one tricky part here that might actually apply to a lot of people hoping to travel in Japan is that I was taking prescribed medication for a scar on my neck, uh, a topical cream so that it would heal faster, and I needed to get a signed letter saying what it was and that I could show to people at customs upon arrival so that I could take in outside medication to Japan with me. So if you do travel with a medication, I would recommend asking your doctor about that. I haven't heard anyone having issues with that before, but it's worth being safe about. Furthermore, I did talk to a lot of other exchange students about this, and even people with pre-existing conditions or medical complications were cleared to go as well. I think the main thing that they check for is that if one has a condition where they need medical assistance fairly often, that that assistance would be available in Japan, and that the proper channels would be available. One of my friends with such a condition was handed a card that had all of her requirements written in Japanese and Korean and other languages that she could hand to doctors. I also heard cases of people with serious food or medication allergies uh, get similar cards so that they could hand those to doctors too and be understood in any language. Another friend had a seafood allergy and they got a similar card that they could show to people at restaurants to make sure that nothing was prepared for them that even touched seafood. So I'm really hoping that any physical conditions won't be an obstacle for people hoping to travel to Japan, and I'd like to say that most doctors and medical professionals are here to help you with that. Also, over four years, my experiences with the Japanese medical system and healthcare system have been smooth and pretty positive, so I'll go into that later in more detail. So, the final obstacle, money, and money was the issue for me. I did not have $5,000, and I know that money for travel is a big point of contention for a lot of people looking to go to Japan as well. I was paying for my education through student loans, but my next loan payment would not come in until after the deadline had passed. So very quickly, I began to hustle for every study abroad in Japan scholarship I could find, and there were plenty, and I'm going to cover that process in as much detail as I can right now. There are a lot of scholarships available. The Japanese government really does want exchange students in Japan. A majority of the money for these scholarships does come straight from the Japanese government, and second to that, there are a fair amount of private organizations that are focused on spreading Japanese culture that will give scholarships as well. The biggest part of almost every one of these scholarship applications is the essay that you write. The essay explaining why you really want to know about Japanese language and culture, and once you have that knowledge, what you intend to do with it. I did a lot of research about successful applicants for these essays, and here's what I found. 
Many students that received scholarships wrote about how they really had a passion for learning Japanese culture and the Japanese language, and that once they had this knowledge, they really wanted to contribute to the education of Japanese culture and its growth. Now, a few things about this. It doesn't necessarily have to be praising Japan or really have to be overly enthusiastic about loving Japanese stuff. Some successful applicants even wrote about Japanese social issues like inequality in the workforce for Japanese women or interest in why the Japanese birth rate has been declining. One of these students was a business major and they expressed interest in one day starting a company in Japan. They expressed interest in how to create a work environment that would promote equality within the Japanese culture. Another thing is that you don't necessarily have to portray yourself as somebody that already has an in depth understanding of anything Japanese. Another applicant received the JASO scholarship and that was about $800 a month and she was a fashion student. She said that she loved the aesthetic of Japanese traditional fashion like the kimono and when she designed fashion in the States she wanted to implement and incorporate patterns and designs from Japanese kimonos and yukatas into her fashion line in the States. But at that time she knew nothing about Japanese fashion or its history and she thought that the best place to learn was in Japan. Other successful applicants included artists that wanted to work in Japanese animation or voice actors that had interest in working in Japanese gaming. All of my research aside, I think it's very important to be genuine with your interest and intentions with what you learn in Japan. I think writing focused on something that you truly have passion on really shines through, opposed to writing something that you think people want to hear. One of the online resources did suggest that applications expressing interest in education and creation of educational media did have a high rate of success. But to be honest, I had never really considered creating educational media at that time, and I didn't really want to write about something I didn't think too much about. At that time, I was really only passionate about the process of learning media creation, whether it be editing or camera work. So I ended up writing about that. I ended up saying that through my learning process within the media field, I was creating media every single day, and I would like to continue that through my stay in Japan and see how my learning process was affected by my time in Japan. I continued to write that I wasn't quite sure what kind of media I would create in Japan, just that I knew I would create a lot of it, and I was interested to see how my videos and photos would organically be affected by my experience there. I know that sounds kind of vague, but it was genuine, and in the end it ended up working. The scholarship application was separate from the school application, so I submitted that first and actually got my answer back first as well. I had been offered a scholarship from JASSO, J-A-S-S-O, granted that I did get accepted into the program and that all the money I got I would spend in Japan. JASO would give me $800 a month for the three months that I was in Japan, and I was thrilled. I remember physically jumping on my bed when I got the news. The fact did remain, however, that I would not get that money unless I was accepted into the program, and I couldn't get accepted into the program unless I had 5k in my bank account. So I was selling a lot of my old stuff on Facebook Marketplace and driving for Uber quite a lot. Not to mention saving every penny that I earned. Oh, and while doing research for this, I definitely found a useful warning. Um, definitely don't try any sort of deception like photoshopping or anything like that, because getting in trouble will definitely jeopardize any chance uh, one might have of studying abroad or any kind of programs in general. I think there are a lot of financial options and ways people would like to help you get around this if uh, money should be a barrier for you. I was up to about 2.5k when the deadline was approaching, and in the end, it wasn't anything clever that I did or any hard work, but my parents actually helped me out. With their help, I ended up getting approved for another student loan of $10,000, which I ended up getting much more quickly. And I am still paying this off to this day, about $200 a month, and it's not really something I want to recommend. Soliciting advice to take out a loan is definitely not something I would do at all, however, it did help me. And again, I think this podcast has the best value if I just go with full honesty and disclosure on everything. So that's what I did, and I know I'm extremely blessed and fortunate to have had that option, and not everybody has that choice, so... I do want to add that I did later find out it is possible to get your application processed without that bank statement saying you have 5k. This is done by petitioning to your advisor and basically writing a letter saying you will be able to earn income up until your departure and some proof of employment. All this being said, I do fully understand why they require you to have at least 5k when you go abroad. Even with a scholarship, kind of having a financial safety net is a very important thing when you're in a strange and different place, I think. As unromantic as it is, I think having money can get you out of a lot of tricky situations where luck just simply can't. So with everything together, I turned in my application in full and it was very exciting. My study abroad advisor went through all of my paperwork with me so that my application would not be rejected on any technicalities or mistakes that I had made. And my application was sent off. I know that up until now, this podcast episode has been very heavy on study abroad information. However, from here on out, the... Preparation for my trip to Japan should be information valid for anybody traveling to Japan through any channel for any purpose. So, about a month passed, and I'm sure as many people could have guessed, I was accepted to the program, and I was definitely in a state of bliss upon hearing that news. 
Immediately, I sent text messages to all my friends, and I called my parents, telling them the news, and they were thrilled as well. I even sent a text message about it to a girl that I had a small crush on, because I was so excited. Her reply came very slow, and usually that would be something that weighed on my mind, but I was so excited that I didn't really care at all. It's funny, I remember so vividly imagining all the scenarios that might happen during my time abroad, all the people I might meet, and all the situations I might find myself in. And looking back, honestly, the things that actually happened were far more amazing than anything I could have even imagined at the time. So if anyone remembers, my application forms came with a list of things I should do to prepare for my trip to Japan. And here on out, I'm going to cover those step by step. Number one was very important, although granted something that I didn't really take into consideration. It basically said stay healthy up until your departure because travel like that can actually have a lot of physical wear on the body. You are going to a place with new foods, new weathers, new environments, and travel is actually a very physically taxing thing. So I guess in response to this I kind of just buckled down on my motivation to go jogging daily, even if it's for a short period of time. And nothing about that was wrong, but in the end I really didn't feel that it was that physically taxing to travel from LA to Japan. Next was to stay in good standing with the school, um, so I made an effort to keep up my studies and I definitely did not do a single thing that could have gotten me in trouble. Third was to keep in consideration that the weather might be very different where you're going, so I studied into Japanese summer, and as I know now very well, Japanese summer is very hot. Uh, the four seasons are very distinct in Japan. So if you're traveling during another season, winter is very cold, I would pack as many layers as you can. For springtime and fall time, uh, the beginning of each season will be drastically different from the end of each season, so pack accordingly. Again, I think packing a lot of layers is a great way to combat a changing temperature in the season. Next up, the list told me to buy tickets as far in advance as possible so I could ensure I arrive on my desired date. Buying tickets pretty far in advance also helps you ensure a better price often. I actually bought my tickets shortly after being accepted to the program so I can walk you through my process. So I found the most affordable tickets on JustFly.com or Cheapo Air. Buying tickets to Japan from these websites has always been pretty solid for me, however I've heard that their return policy is kind of tricky so if you have to cancel your trip to Japan, I might recommend some other service that will give you your refund more quickly. My classes in Japan would start on June 20th, and I now know that that is not the most inexpensive time to buy tickets to Japan, but it's also not the most expensive. To be general, I now know that the prices of tickets in and out of Japan often fluctuate based on when students have vacation. Japanese summer vacation actually starts fairly late, so the middle of summer is a fairly expensive time to buy tickets, so is the middle of winter when winter break begins. In Japan, one full school year ends at the beginning of spring when spring break begins, and the new school year begins in spring term when the spring opening ceremonies happen. Because of this, the cheapest time to fly to Japan is actually during those spring entrance ceremonies, because no students can travel during that time and miss those. This would be early April, and I like that personally because that is around the time when the sakura blossoms bloom and you can see all the cherry blossoms all around Japan. It's beautiful. But I digress, so I purchased my ticket for $520 out of LAX and into Osaka at Kansai International Airport, or KIX. I would arrive on January 18th, right before the spike of prices when all the students get out of school and can travel. And I would be flying with Korea Air with one layover in Korea. Most of the more affordable flights, especially through just fly or cheapoair.com, have a layover someplace, and that makes them much more inexpensive. I saved my email with my receipt and booking number, and I kept my fingers crossed that I could get a seat with a window, because I very much liked the view of airplanes taking off and landing. I realized that was a pretty long tangent for a single point on the list of what to do to prepare yourself for a trip, however, I feel that was necessary. Anyway, the final point was, observe the cultures of the country that you're going to travel to. This is something that I have actually made quite a lot of media on, in YouTube and TikTok, however, at this point in time, I really just googled it. Now, when I did inevitably arrive in Japan, there was a cultural orientation that covered this in depth, taught by a cultural professor, so I'll go into detail and stuff at that point, but for now I'll just show what I researched. And the surface level was basically bow a little bit when you have an interaction with somebody, and don't talk on the cell phone on the train. I realize that's about as shallow as you can go into the culture, however, this kind of gives a snapshot of my cultural experience at that point in time. I did learn some more important information about cultural awareness when I went to my pre-departure orientation, however, before I get into that, I would like to add some tips of my own to this list that I kind of learned through experience after going back and forth to Japan multiple times. First off is packing for your trip, and something that I have forgotten before that is actually much more easy to get in the states is an adapter for outlets. Plugs in Japanese walls only have two sockets whereas American ones have a third one to basically ground the charge. 
So if you have any important plugs, like my laptop charger that has a third prong, they're not gonna work in Japan. The voltage in Japan is actually different from America also. America has a voltage of 120 as standard, and Japan has 100, so this can affect some different charging habits if you don't have an adapter. Also, I would recommend saving some room in your suitcase for souvenirs that you might want to buy in Japan. I often make that space by packing less clothing than I think I may need, and this is because I really like seeing what kind of fashion is popular in Japan at the time and getting clothing once I arrive. However, for me, my shoe size is size 12, and this translates into a size 30 in Japan, which is kind of hard to come by, so I do pack shoes that I think I might need for multiple occasions, because it might be kind of tricky for me to get them in Japan. And last personal tip, and this one might be too personal and only specific to me, but I really enjoy hot sauce, and my favorite hot sauces are kind of hard to find in Japan, so I kind of pack hot sauce on my own too. And bonus tip for anybody trying to travel anywhere really would be a pocket-sized charger so that you can charge your cell phone um, on longer parts of your trip. Anyway, spring quarter began, and it was not a lie, my workload was intense, but I kept motivated because I had this goal of going to Japan and keeping my GPA high. I also kept up a solid workout routine, which is not always easy for me to do. I was kind of going out to parties less, and I was staying in a lot and doing research on Japan in my free time. And I even kind of lost interest in that one girl I mentioned I had a crush on. But enough about me, and June came, and so did pre-departure orientation. This orientation was in the morning at Campus 9 at UC Santa Cruz. I made sure to try to arrive early in case I got lost. I found the door and I entered the empty dining hall. There was a full wall of windows overlooking the forest, and probably about 40 students, who I assumed were also planning to study abroad. I signed in, then I was given a name tag with the Japanese flag on it to show which country I was going to. I saw several other students who also had the Japanese flag in their name tag sitting in a group by the corner, and that was kind of reassuring that I was in the right place. But I remember going to sit on my own in the front. I'm not sure why, but I might just be a bit shy, especially probably when it comes to initiating a friendship based on a single commonality. But they all seemed very cool though, so I was pretty excited about that. Anyway, the pre-departure orientation began, and immediately we jumped right into being an ambassador for our state, our country, and our school. This is kind of a theme that might seem very specific to studying abroad, however, I think it's kind of a cool idea, regardless of why you travel. It basically covers the idea that, if you go abroad, you are a representation of your country for everyone that you meet there. And because of this, it's very responsible to try to be the best representation of that country that you can be. This includes approaching new cultures with an open mind, and often taking a stance to listen rather than speak. As well as always reminding oneself to be respectful, and generally just being a decent human which I support 100%. And then the speaker, who was a former exchange student herself, went into some examples of people and students who were not the best ambassadors for the country, to put it politely. I will cover the examples that took place in Japan. The first story was about a student that got drunk in Shibuya, Tokyo, and tried to take a shortcut back to the station by hopping over fences through residencies and businesses. Now, I take issue with this regardless of where it is or what the consequences were for this action. But this guy got into trouble, specifically when he hopped the fence to a Japan Defense Force military training facility. And I bet you can guess how much pressure it put on the exchange program when an American national that they were responsible for got caught breaking into the government-owned property where people trained to defend Japan. So I guess that kind of falls under the category of just being generally decent when you go to Japan. However, the next one is a bit more specific and could be useful. So, another exchange student, this time in Osaka, ended up going to a Kabakura, uh, which is a hostess club, maybe by mistake, as he claimed, or maybe, I mean, they seem like an enticing place, I can understand. But basically, he ordered quite a lot, and he ended up spending quite a bit of time there too, which you have to pay for. So, when it came time to pay the bill, he came up pretty short, by about $1,000. And these are not the kind of places where you can really come up short on your bill, so he got in trouble with the police and got sent home, but I think that it could have actually been a bit worse. The moral here is that if you're going into Kabakura or a host club, I think you should really be going with somebody that knows what they're doing if you don't know yourself, or at least have an excessive amount of money that you don't mind blowing. I took these stories to heart, and then eventually we ended up separating into groups based on which country we were going to go to. And I was right, everybody else in my group seemed pretty cool, and there was one other kid going to the same program as me, however he did not show up that day. I'm not really sure what people's first impression of me really often is, however at that time I think I was really just very excited to learn, so I think I was just pretty quiet. I heard all about how my program would have two classes a day, how we would have one optional overnight trip to Hiroshima, and I had the options of staying with a host family or in a private apartment. I definitely opted into the overnight trip because I thought it would be like the school trip episode in a lot of anime that I liked, and I did opt for my private apartment. 
The idea of staying with the Japanese family sounded amazing, and I heard great things from other people that did so. However, when I heard that there might be a curfew, which I understand, they don't want the family being woken up when you come home late, um, I realized that might not be exactly for me. And that was it. They had some free food and a small wrap-up party, so I grabbed a slice of pizza to take back to my dorm because I had to study a lot. I was more excited than ever, and I don't know if other people do this, but I kept imagining the kind of people that would be in my group, and who they would be, and what kind of people I would be spending that time of my life with. And also wondering a little bit if any of them would be cute. So, finals commenced, and I maintained my GPA, and I began packing. It was kind of sad leaving my dorm room that I had so many good memories in, but I was excited to go home too, because I missed Los Angeles. And of course, the most excitement came from me knowing I would actually be going to Japan in three weeks from that point. Looking back on that time now, I'm always excited when I come here to Japan. However, that first initial feeling was unparalleled. So if you're going to Japan for your first time too, enjoy that feeling because it's great, I think. And I do remember being nervous too, but everything I was worried about was fairly unfounded. So if you are nervous also, then just, I know it's not helpful, but I don't think you need to be. Spring quarter passed wild quickly, and uh, while I was studying for my finals, I took the time to try to learn some Japanese. I studied hiragana, and I downloaded the app HelloTalk, which is free, and uh, it lets you connect with Japanese people that have interest in learning English. And uh, in exchange, you can practice Japanese with them too, and I actually met some good friends on that app too, so I recommend checking that out. I wasn't personally really able to internalize much of the Japanese language by self-study, however many can. And uh, that just shows that I think I needed to up my study regimen. However, even the little bit of hiragana practice I did, I think, helped ease my way into the kind of intensive Japanese language course in Japan. Looking back now, I think getting hiragana down is a great foundation for Japanese classes if you're going there to study abroad. And if you're going there for travel, some basic phrases like sumimasen, which is excuse me, arigato, which is thank you, and kore wa doko desu ka, which is where's this, are great phrases that can kind of help you ease your way into social situations. After you have excuse me down, I think using Google Translate will help you basically communicate with everybody and anytime I use that app, I was met with extreme patience from a lot of people too. And I even had a lot of friendships that were based on Google Translate for quite some time actually too. So I passed my finals, I packed up and cleaned out of my dorm room, which I had some amazing memories in and that was kind of a sad moment, but I was excited more than anything else. And I left my school. I arrived in LA, and I started buying all the clothes I could afford that I imagined would be cool for me to wear in Japan. Looking back, I do kind of wish I saved some of that money and space for buying clothes once I actually arrived in Japan. I do always like to maintain my own personal style, however I often like how that style is influenced by my trips to Japan, so more notes for my future too. The last thing I had to do was go pick up my visa from the Japanese embassy in Los Angeles where I had mailed all my paperwork and my application. And here is another tip, because I think I cut it kind of close. I picked up my visa about three days before my departure. And if there were any mistakes, or the embassy was closed for the next two days, or I had problems paying, then I might have been completely out of luck. So if you can learn from my mistake and save yourself some stress, then I'm happy I made this podcast already. A final thing that I did before I left was buy a lot of American gifts and souvenirs so that I could give them to people that I met. Although I did opt out of the homestay option, I did overhear them talking about how... If you do have a host family, it's nice to bring them a gift, so I thought I would do the same for people that I could encounter. I read someplace online that a lot of Japanese families don't quite enjoy clutter, so instead of buying little toys or magnets for the fridge, I bought a lot of snacks and some hot sauce. I grew up in a place called Topanga on the outskirts of Los Angeles, and they make clothing there, specifically t-shirts with the Topanga logo on them, so I bought a good amount of those as well. Saying goodbye to my Los Angeles friends was kind of bittersweet. This would be the first summer that I had not spent with them in a long time. However, they were all very excited for me to go to Japan and I was excited for myself as well. So finally, it was the night before my flight and I was doing the online check-in through my airline's homepage. And yes, I got a window seat. I had this weird anxiety that I had forgotten the date of my flight or something and that I would miss the orientation and miss my whole program. But that just goes to show again that I think we all get nervous about small things before we do something new, and that wasn't really founded in anything in reality. Although I still always double and triple check my departure dates and my departure times for anything, because I am sometimes a forgetful person. I've heard it's a good idea to show up about two hours before your flight if you have an international air flight, so that's what I did. And I kissed my parents goodbye, and I waved bye to my sister and promised her I would bring her video game stuff like she asked for, and I was on my way. 
I chose my favorite clothing for travel because I like to feel like I look cool on airplanes, and I took my seat next to the window after security and looked out. On my iPod, I played my favorite energetic yet slightly melancholy song as I felt the plane leave the ground and I watched Los Angeles disappear below me. And that was it. I was off to a summer in Japan for three months, and that is the end of Season 1, Episode 1, so thank you so, so much for listening. Now signing off, once again, I'm Wes Mather, and that was Season 1, Episode 1 of the Travel Japan with Wes Mather podcast. Next up is Season 1, Episode 2, which will cover arriving in Japan, cultural things that surprised me, how to prepare yourself for getting an apartment or a place to stay, and my first classes as well. Also, some of the friendships I began to make, and how I recommend making friends in Japan also. Making this podcast actually took quite a bit of time, and I now learned a lot about the technical elements of making it, and I'm slowly getting more used to speaking into a microphone for an extended period of time too. That being said, I do hope and believe that quality and performance will improve over time, so thank you for bearing with me. Also, I'm always open and excited about questions and comments and suggestions for how I can improve my podcast. If you think it's too personal or uh, not factual enough or anything like that, please feel free to comment on my YouTube or my TikTok or message me on Instagram as well, all of which can be found by the name Wes Mather. And yes, I know I'm not very creative with making up names for media, and I will take all these recommendations into full consideration. Future podcasts will also deviate from the narrative to cover interviews with interesting people I meet in Japan, as well as interviews with people who have experience teaching in Japan, traveling in Japan, working in Japan, or studying in Japan through programs uh, different from mine, like high school programs or language programs that you can apply to directly without being involved at a school already. I'm also going to interview some American friends that have been teaching in Japan for quite some time through various programs, as well as some travelers that have interesting stories about trips to Japan. If you enjoyed this content, please feel free to subscribe to my podcast and check out my other social media, and also any sort of review would mean a lot to me. So thanks so much again for listening, and have a fantastic day. So that was Season 1, Episode 1 of the Travel Japan with West Method podcast. If you got any value from this, please consider liking and subscribing to my YouTube channel, as well as checking out my podcast, and the link to that is in the description. I will have new content out weekly, with new segments such as news in Japan, as well as questions that I answer from listeners. And finally, new Japanese phrases and terms that pertain to that episode's content, if you have interest in learning the language. Links to my Instagram and TikTok where I have more Japanese media are also in my description. And please consider checking out my merchandise as well. I hope you enjoyed and have a fantastic day and safe travels. Goodbye.